right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. So as many of you may know, February was a crazy month for us. We did 80 programs in the month, which is absolute bedlam. So we're taking it a bit easier this month. We're only going to do like 35 programs by the end. So still a really, really good time, a whole diverse slate of topics. Some of you might be joining us from our last hour, where we we talked about Okapi conservation in West Africa, which was really exciting. But today's talk, we are diving in on continuing an epic partnership series with the Arctic Institute of North America. So they are the first and foremost Arctic Institute in the continent, uh, live from Calgary. So they, they've done a whole slew of programs with them over the last few months, which you can all check out on our YouTube channel. Today, we are joined by Michael Alchin, and he is going to talk to us about how global warming can cause snowfall in Mexico. You know, when I was a kid, global warming was something that we were just starting to talk about, just starting to get in the public radar. And for kids today, for all the kids in our classrooms, this is something that you guys have grown up with, you know about, you recognize as an issue. And we're starting to see these strange weather events around the globe, like snowfall in Mexico. So Michael's going to explain a little bit about the backdrop of climate change today, explain how those weather events happen, and explain uh, all the understanding, what it took to develop the knowledge to get where we are today. So Michael, without further ado, thank you so much for joining us. And I can't wait to uh, take us away. Go for it. Well, hello everyone. Thank you very much indeed for tuning in. Um, yes, we're gonna talk about how global warming can cause snowfall in Mexico, not just Mexico, but other places where it's perhaps a bit surprising. And this has been something which seems to have confused some important people, uh, perhaps they're politicians, perhaps they're important business people, uh, but this seems to have confused them. And some of them have said, hey, how can this be happening if there's global warming? Maybe it's not such a big deal. But sure enough, over the past couple of months, we've seen some snow occurring in places that you don't normally expect it. It happened in the capital of Spain, in Madrid, early in January. Uh, I think the most snow that they'd ever seen, pretty much. Uh, this is summer we normally think of as being fairly warm, fairly dry. This is a strange weather event. Same deal in Greece, just about a month later on. Uh, and around the same time, of course, uh, right the way down into Mexico itself. And of course, there were lots of folks across the south of the United States who had a really unpleasant time for a while uh, because it was such an unusual event. Uh, so the big question is, does this suggest that global warming is not a big deal? And here's a spoiler. No, it really doesn't. So the first point I want to make is these are all weather events. When we talk about weather and climate, we need to sort out what we mean uh, by each of those phrases. And this phrase is one that you will see quite often. It's probably uh, the most famous explanation is that climate is what on an average we may expect, and weather is what we actually get. So let's unpack that. Whether it's what's happening at a particular time or over a short period of time, well, we can see and measure it. We can me measure temperature, rainfall, we can look at clouds, all sorts of things like that. So we can see and understand weather any particular time. Climate's a different deal. It's the range of weather conditions we might expect as judged from observing them over a really long time. So over 30 years or more. We cannot see or measure it directly. We can't look out of the window and say, hey, the climate's really nice today. Just thinking about that in a different way, uh, climate is what might govern what you choose to have in your closet. Have you got a really warm winter coat and a pair of snow boots that you need? Do you have a waterproof jacket and rain boots? Or do t-shirts and flip-flops do it for you year round? That is judged primarily by climate. It's the range of clothing that you think you need to get through the range of conditions you experience. Whereas weather determines which ones of those, which items of clothing you choose to put on. So here's a map showing the great variety of different climates around the world. Each color here is a different climate uh, in, and you can see that they're spread around the world and there's a whole bunch of them. And they're distinguished on the basis of how warm or cold they are, how wet or dry they are, and when uh, different types of event occur during the, the, the year. So there may be some times of the year when it's really wet or really dry, for example, or maybe damp year round. 
When we're looking at this and trying to make sense of it, we need to refer to three important imaginary lines that we draw right the way around the world. First one is that the equator, right the way around the middle, so half of the world is to the south of it and half is to the north. These are called hemispheres. And then the Antarctic and the Arctic circle towards the south and the north pole, respectively. And we'll see a bit more about those as we go through the slides. I think you can begin to see that the colors on the map are kind of reflected either side of the equator. So you can see there are these blue colors uh, just either side of the equator, uh, which are known as the tropics. So those blue areas, a lot of those correspond to areas where there are uh, tropical rainforests, jungles. If we go out a bit further, we see those red and orange areas. Those are mostly hot desert areas in the subtropics. A little bit further again into the mid latitudes, pale greens and pale blues, lots of grasslands and deciduous forests. Out a little bit further again, we're getting closer to the poles now. We call these the circumpolar lands. And these are typified by uh, wide expanses of coniferous forests. And then up into the polar regions themselves, which are either open tundra, not many trees at all, or snow and ice. So you can see there really is a mirror of climates each side of the equator that goes out uh, towards the poles in each direction. And to understand this, we need to think about a few different things. First of all, we need to think about how the Earth uh, gets its energy from the sun and how that varies through the year. Now, these diagrams are not to scale, okay? The sun is much, much, much bigger than the Earth. But just so that we can see what's going on, I'm showing the Earth as much bigger than the sun and much, much closer to it than it really is. And as we know, the Earth rotates around uh, another imaginary line which goes through the north and south poles and it's called the axis of rotation. And that axis is tilted. And that tilt is essentially what gives us seasons. So here are our three important lines of the equator, the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic Circle. Uh, and on the bright green bit towards the sun, it's daytime. And the darker part, it's nighttime. And you can see that's away from the sun. So the Earth is spinning around that red line every day. I think that you can see that the Arctic Circle, you can spin that circle right the way around. And that part above the Arctic Circle is never going to go into the nighttime. So this is in the middle of the northern summer, the 21st of June or thereabouts. So at that time of year, the North Pole is getting lots of sunlight during the day. In contrast, you look at the other end of the Earth, the Antarctic Circle, and it's completely in the nighttime. So directly opposite where the sun is shining onto the Earth, it's hot. A little bit outside that, it's warm, not quite so hot, and then cooler. And then in the Antarctic, where it's not getting any sunlight at all, it is cold, colder than your freezer. Let's fast forward six months. Let's go right the way through until uh, the 21st of December, which is known as the Northern Winter Solstice. And you can see now that that axis of rotation is now tipping away from the sun. So the situation has kind of reversed. It's still hot and warm, at those lower latitudes, fairly close to the equator. It's cooler either side of them. And now it's the turn of the Arctic to be really cold. It's not getting any sunlight at all. It's not getting any energy from the sun, no solar radiation. It's not able to generate any warmth at all. So there we have a quick idea of how uh, hot and cold varies really widely between the two poles and not nearly so much around the equator where it stays relatively warm or hot. So let's zoom in a little bit. So here's just the northern part of the, the planet. So from the equator at the bottom up to the North Pole uh, at the top, and I've shown the Arctic Circle there as well. And we've got this idea that uh, the sun is landing uh, straight onto the equator. An important thing that's worth knowing about sunshine is that it's not warm until it hits something. It's just this uh, wave that travels uh, through space, and through the atmosphere, and eventually hits something. When it hits something and it is absorbed by that something, that's the point at which it's turned to heat. Now, at the equator, or near the equator, it is hitting those objects, and that surface, 
at close to 90 degrees. This means that the sunshine is really focused, it's really intense, and most of it is turned to heat. So near the equator, at these lower latitudes, it is hot to warm. If we go up to high latitudes near the pole, then the sunshine is spread out. And the reason for that is, one of the reasons is that it's hitting the earth at a much larger angle. So as the sunshine hits the surface, it's spread out. It's not nearly so intense, uh, and so it doesn't heat up as much. Another point is that uh, in the polar regions, there's much more snow and ice, and that tends to reflect the sunlight. Instead of being absorbed, it bounces back out into the atmosphere and potentially back out towards space. So there's much less solar energy absorbed near the poles, uh, and on top of that, you've got several months of the year when you don't get any sunshine at all, so it's much colder. So there's a big distinction between the lower latitudes near the equator, which are hot to warm, and the cool to cold higher latitudes near the pole. One other point we need to uh, know about is the atmosphere, this bubble of gas wrapped around the Earth. The lowest part of it is called the troposphere. Now, nearly all the air in the atmosphere is in the troposphere. About 80% or eight tenths of it is in the troposphere. And pretty much all the water vapor as well. So this is where weather happens. It ranges in height from about 12 miles near the equator uh, down to about uh, five miles or so uh, at the poles. So that's important for us because it's where weather happens. Within the troposphere, it's warm and near the Earth's surface. As we know, that's where the warmth originates from that sunshine hitting the surface and turning into heat. As you get further away from the Earth's surface, then the air gets cooler. So there's the troposphere, the lowest layer of the atmosphere. And one other part of it we need to know about is called the stratosphere. That's the next layer above. There's still some air in there, but not very much. Uh, and it's important for us in a way we'll see next. So we've got a hot equator and a cold pole, then there's a big difference in the amount of heat in the atmosphere. And nature doesn't like differences. It likes to even them out. So where this heat uh, is, is uh, occurring, is being generated near the equator, the air rises. And as it rises, it gets further away from the surface, it cools down. And as it does so, it may well drop rainfall. So this rising air is associated with those tropical rainforests, the blue climates that we saw on the map. As it reaches the top of the troposphere, it cools and starts to sink again. And this has a buddy here. So now we have sinking air, and that's associated with a lack of rainfall. It's unlikely to generate rainfall. Uh, and so that's where we find deserts. Now the air is heated up a bit more, is transferred further to the north and begins to rise. So this has a friend as well here. So now yet again, we have rising air, a good chance for rainfall. And here we have now cool and wet forests. These are known as the boreal forests. And to finish off the loop near the pole, it sinks down again. Sinking air is unlikely to give us rain or snow. So we have cold, dry polar deserts. And don't forget, up in the pole, this is where we get long, dark winters, the polar night, which lasts for several months. And between the really cold air up in the pole, polar district uh, and the less cold to warm air further south, there's a really clear distinction in the troposphere between the two. And this is known as the polar front. Tucked up here, at the top of the troposphere, just below the polar front, there is a narrow band of strong winds, which is generated by this circulation of rising and sinking air together with the circulation of the Earth. And this is known as a polar jet stream. Another name for it, a longer name, but it's an important one, is the tropospheric polar vortex. You may have heard the polar vortex, and it's uh, a term that I hope you'll be uh, much more knowledgeable about by the end of this little talk here. So the polar jet stream is a big deal for us. This is a map of the Earth showing the jet stream, and I'm just going to bring it up live here. Hopefully you're seeing a moving picture now. And those red uh, moving bands you can see, 
that is our polar jet stream or tropospheric polar vortex moving around the planet. Strong winds often used by airliners uh, to, to kind of hitch a ride. They surf on these winds to make their journey faster uh, if they're going from west to east. So that's an idea of what it looks like. So remembering that polar front, that sharp divide between the much colder air to the north and the warmer air to the south, if that distinction in temperatures, if that difference in temperatures is really clear, if there's a really cold on one side, much warmer on the other, then the jet stream tends to be faster. And when it's faster, it clips around the globe in a reasonably straight line. It doesn't wave up and down very much. It does a little bit here and there because it can be influenced when it crosses over major coastlines or big mountain ranges. But by and large, if you have a really sharp difference between warm and cold, either side of the polar front, you get a fast jet stream, you get a straight jet stream traveling straight around the globe. Something that we have noticed increasingly by a variety of different observations is that the jet stream has become wavier. It's taking a much more loopy course. And this is interesting for a number of reasons and speaks right to our topic today. So what might be causing this? Well, we have to think, first of all, about the fact that the Arctic up near the North Pole is warming much more quickly than anywhere else on Earth. I'm going to run through a little movie here. And when you see it, pale blue or yellow colors show that the temperatures are round about the average over a long period of time. Darker blues mean that they're colder and darker reds mean that they're warmer. And we're going to start, as you can see, way back at the end of the 19th century, 1880, and we're going to run all the way forward until the present day. So here we go. Now at 1900, you can see it's not very much difference at all from the long-term observations. As we progress through now in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 1990s, 2000s, 2010s, and it's going to disappear. But I grabbed that last screen. Here's the last screen. So this is the comparison between the average temperatures between 2015 and 2019 with what they were between 1951 and 1980. You can see all those really dark red colors up around the Arctic. They show how much warmer it has become there relative to pretty much anywhere else on the planet. So there's the key takeaway, is that the Arctic has got much, much warmer, much more rapidly than other regions. Here's another way of looking at it. Same kind of map where the dark red means uh, more warming. When we look at the equator, the graph down at the bottom shows that the temperature increase between 1960, that's just a few years before I was born, can you believe it, to 2019, it's only increased by about one degree Celsius. That's about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. If we look at the same difference up at the North Pole, that's way higher. It's four degrees Celsius or about seven degrees Fahrenheit of increase in the average annual temperature. So the Arctic has got a lot warmer, a lot more quickly, and this is directly as a result of global warming. If people are interested, I can talk more about that after the main talk. So if we get a warmer Arctic, we tend to get a slower jet stream because the temperature difference on each side of the polar front gets smaller. So down towards the south, it's got a bit warmer so far, not very much, whereas up near the Arctic, it's really quite a lot warmer. Because of that, the jet stream blows more slowly. There's a smaller temperature difference either side of the polar front, and so the jet stream is slower. And because it's slower, it's like a big river. It begins to flow from side to side, begins to meander, and becomes wavier. So what's the big deal with a wavy jet stream? Well, it really affects our weather in lots of different ways. The jet stream pushes weather along uh, around the planet uh, and a wavy jet stream can hold it up, or speed it up. Uh, it can make it warmer or it can make it colder. The way it does it is this. Uh, we know, of course, we've got warmer to the south, cooler to the north. 
And it turns out that where we get these kind of uh, waves which go up towards the north when we're looking down on the map from above, it also corresponds to a, a, a vertical wave in the atmosphere. So these areas are called ridges. And on the western side of ridges, winds tend to flow from south to north. So they're bringing warmer air into cooler regions. And they're also associated with warmer, dry, settled weather. Dips are known as troughs. And where we get troughs, we tend to get winds which flow from north to south along their western edges. So these are flowing from cooler to warmer regions. And in regions which are experiencing troughs, you tend to get cool or cold and often stormy weather. So immediately we can see the possibility that if you have a, one of these big wavy troughs developing and it's carrying colder air further to the south, this is already a way in which our uh, connection is being made from warmer Arctic through global warming to a wavier jet stream to the chance of cooler, colder weather being dragged further down to the south. This is just part of the story. This is our tropospheric polar vortex. Turns out there's another polar vortex. So here's the tropospheric polar vortex down at the bottom there, and you can see that's fairly wavy. And there's another one further up, out in the stratosphere, called the stratospheric polar vortex, or the polar night jet, which I think sounds like a pretty cool name. And that only sets up in the winter when the polar area is not getting any sunlight at all. You can think of the stratospheric polar vortex as being a bit like a big spoon that's stirring the air around in the troposphere below, and it helps to keep the jet stream, the tropospheric polar vortex, moving around in a fairly regular manner. Here is uh, another of my favorite websites, Maps. Uh, I don't know if you want to pop that up, Jesse, but earth.nullschool.net is the site that I'm using for this. Uh, this shows the stratospheric polar vortex, the polar night jet. You can see it's quite a tight circle. It's a nice, neat, uh, here it's kind of an oval, but you can see it's not really wavy at all. This is because it's so much further up, it's not really affected uh, by uh, land and oceans and things like that. Okay. So what happens sometimes is that with this wavier jet stream, this wavier tropospheric polar vortex, we know that we might get big ridges. If you get a big ridge, which we know is associated with heat, with energy, sometimes that can get so large, thanks again to global warming, to extra heat in the atmosphere, that it breaks out of the troposphere and into the stratosphere and it messes up that stratospheric polar vortex, really disrupts it. And also, uh, that's called a sudden stratospheric warming event. It also injects heat right down into the polar region itself. Here's a picture uh, or an animation showing one of these events where you get this big thwack from one of these big ridges and it completely disrupts the stratospheric polar vortex. You can see it's spinning off there into little kind of vestiges of itself. Here we go again. There it is to begin with, quite happy. It's about to get a big tail slap and off it goes, splitting apart, disappearing, and it begins to mess up what's happening below. And this is what happened earlier on in this year. So this looks a bit like a, a big smiley face. Uh, but the stratospheric polar vortex are split into two. And the key point to look at here is those purple winds, which are flowing from north to south, right between the two kind of eyes of the smiley face. So let's look lower down in the atmosphere at the same time. And here we have uh, what the tropospheric polar vortex was doing. So you can see that those strong winds flowing towards the south in the stratosphere were pushing the tropospheric polar vortex, the jet stream, much further south. And if we switch from looking at winds to looking at what temperatures were doing near the surface, then these blue colors, right down as far as Texas and Mexico, that's the cold. So the strong winds in the stratosphere were pushing the tropospheric polar vortex or jet stream further to the south, really deep trough, and that was introducing those cold, cold conditions 
all the way further to the south. Here's a different representation of it. Yet again, dark blues or even light kind of purpley colors are really cold conditions, much, much colder than we would expect. And you can see over much of uh, central and southern North America, you've got those really unusual cold temperatures. Meanwhile, up near the pole, these bright red and dark orange colors show that it was much, much warmer near the pole at the same time. And this is what was happening in the middle of February. This is how we got those cold conditions dragged further down into, uh, into Mexico, into the southern US. So just to sum up here, the Arctic is warming much more quickly than anywhere else on Earth. This is reducing the temperature contrast across the polar front. We're getting a, a slower and wavier jet stream or tropospheric polar vortex. We get really big ridges with lots of heat energy in them. They may break through into the stratosphere, causing sudden stratospheric warming. When this happens, it disrupts, first of all, the stratospheric polar vortex and in turn disrupts the jet stream below. And this is how we get these really deep troughs which stretch far to the south and they introduce cold, cold conditions and the possibility of snow. So there's a good link between uh, the mechanisms of global warming and how we get these cold conditions. And in fact, this connection is, is better. We understand more about how global warming drives unusual cold spells than pretty much any other kind of extreme weather event. And a, a good way of remembering that uh, how this, this goes together is to use the term global weirding. It's not just global warming, it's climate change which is often resulting in unusual conditions in places. So when you hear people in future talking about the tropospheric polar vortex, in fact, if you just hear them talking about the polar vortex, because often they don't say which they're talking about, I would like you all just to cough a little bit like this, say, ahem, and then ask them, do they mean the tropospheric polar vortex or the stratospheric polar vortex? Because they have different influences and different mechanisms, and you now know more than they do. Thank you very much for watching. Well, thank you, Michael. That was great. Uh, if you want to come out of screen share, we'll have a bit of a conversation. You can see us again, so I'll give you a second to do that. Uh, we've got our live groups. We've got five live classes with us today, a bunch more on YouTube. If you are on YouTube and you're a teacher, just let me know where you're joining from. We can take some questions from you guys as well. What I think we'll do is we'll start with Miss Russell's class. Miss Russell's class is joining us today in Brampton, just down the street from me here in Toronto. Uh, if you want to kick us off with a question, come on in and go for it. Hi there. Uh, I'm not certain if we have a question ready for you yet. I'm just waiting for some uh, folks to give me their ideas. No worries. So take your time with that. We'll come back in a minute. Let's go to Ms. Lemire's class. Uh, Ms. Lemire is joining us in uh, Admiral Collingwood Elementary. So come on in, guys, and take us away. All right. I'm just wondering, we're wondering, um, they said in an earlier presentation that we did with you that um, the, the ice in the Arctic could melt in the summer as early as the year 2030. Yeah. I'm wondering what that ice melt, what type of effect it will have on the polar vortex. Is that, I know it's catastrophic. I know it's going to change climate as we know it, yeah. but how is the how does the polar vor vortex oh come in with that? We, 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 could do, we could do several months on that. Uh, it's something, it's something that scientists are debating really fiercely because uh, if there is no ice over the Arctic Ocean, then it means you have a much darker surface. If you have a much darker surface, you are reflecting less sunlight and absorbing more of it and generating more warmth. So you're kind of helping that process of adding warm bubbles of heat in places which are unused to them. And just how that interacts with the root of the jet stream, how it contributes to the formation of ridges and troughs is a big deal. Because if you, of course, if you have uh, pretty much an ice-free Arctic in the late summer, it's going to take longer for ice to form in, as the winter develops. You've got more warmth persisting for longer. And that might impact uh, even how the stratospheric polar vortex evolves. Uh, 
So there's enormous debate over just what the influences might be, and it gets extraordinarily complicated. I don't pretend to, to understand uh, at, at least half of it, if not more. It's complex stuff because of the thermodynamics relating the amount of heat that's absorbed in the ocean, the amount which is uh, then radiated into the atmosphere, and how that is distributed through the troposphere and potentially into the stratosphere. Okay. So uh, I, I hope that's not too much of a kind of cop out, um, but but it 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 is absolutely a, a key point that uh, by exposing more of the ocean, making it darker, absorbing and radiating more heat, there is strong potential for uh, influencing circulation of air uh, in the troposphere and potentially higher up as well. Yeah. And I, I think that that's important to this topic. Uh, it's something that's something you really, you know, it, it's worth highlighting that, that there's a lot more to learn. Um, it's something that was sort of infused throughout your entire presentation. So a uh, great question to kick us off, Ms. Lemire. We're, we're going to stump the scientists today. I'm, I'm very excited. Um, Michael, I'm sorry I muted. There was a little bit of a reverb there. So I just wanted to make sure people could hear that. Um, Ms. Russell, if you guys have a question for us, uh, come on back in. Michael, you can unmute your mic as well. And Ms. Russell, go for it. And we're good to go. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna summarize a few questions we have here. Um, we're wondering about how often the jet streams mess up the polar vortex and how long those polar vortexes last. Yeah, again, yeah, no, don't, uh, uh, turn that around. Remember that we're talking about two different types of polar vortex. So on the one hand, there's the, the polar vortex which works in the troposphere lower down nearer the earth and then there's the other one the big one up in the stratosphere way higher up so when people say oh there's a polar vortex coming mm, it really implies that they they are not clear on what they're talking about what we need to think about is what is happening with each of these two vortices so if the the lower down one what let's call them a jet stream is the lower down one so if that's getting wavy and looping backwards and forwards. This is happening quite frequently, and we see it right the way through the year because the jet stream exists all the way through the year. It's there in the summer and there in the winter. If we get a ridge in summer out here in, in the West, in British Columbia, we get pretty worried about things like wildfires because it tends to be dry and warm. If we get a trough, then we tend to get stormy weather and cooler weather. So these sorts of things tend to be happening pretty much all the time. And looking at that website uh, is a, a really nice way of being able to see what's happening. If you were to look at it right now, I would predict that you would find a nice ridge uh, over the eastern part of Canada, uh, which is delivering warm conditions there at the moment. Now, the biggest difference that we've seen this year is this sudden stratospheric warming this disruption of the stratospheric polar vortex such that it messes up the jet stream and really confuses uh, the weather systems. Now, this is uh, something which only occurs perhaps every one or two years. There's some suggestion that it may be happening more frequently, but the jury is still out on that. We haven't been able to observe it uh, with enough detail really to get a good handle on how frequently it happens normally, whatever normally might be, and whether or not that frequency is changing. Are we getting more of them? Are they happening at shorter intervals between them? We do know that we're only gonna get them in winter because that's the only time that the stratospheric polar vortex is going to be circulating. It's completely dependent on uh, the timing of the polar night. Does that help? So, Ms. Russell, is there any follow-up for that? or um, No follow-up uh, in the chat here, but thank you for helping to clarify. Yeah, you nailed it. Um, let's head to Hawaii. I miss Matt Suda's class uh, joining us. If you guys want to unmute your microphone, and then we'll go to Ms. Peck's class in a minute. Thanks to our YouTube classes for sharing some questions as well. Uh, but Ms. Matt Suda, go for it. Hey, uh, we're grade four and five students in Hawaii. And uh, a question that I would ask is, um, how might this affect us living in, in Hawaii. Um, and then also as a follow-up, um, if kids are concerned, what are some things that they could or should be doing in their lives? 
Mm, okay, those are two huge questions. Now, first of all, in Hawaii, uh, it's a very special set of circumstances. A relatively small bunch of islands. I'm not being disrespectful here, but compared to the size of the Pacific Ocean, it's a little bit of land in an awful lot of water. So the bigger deal there is the fact that the ocean has absorbed so much of the additional heat that's been absorbed by the atmosphere. Perhaps we need to just step back for a minute here and think how global warming happens. In the atmosphere, there are gases like carbon dioxide and methane, which kind of hold on to heat. And as I was saying, sunlight itself is not hot to begin with. Once it hits the Earth's surface and is absorbed, it turns into heat and it radiates out into the troposphere. And that's where it meets these gases and is held on by them, like a, a, a thermal insulating blanket. Now, some of that heat is transmitted back down into the ocean. In fact, an awful lot of it, more than 90% of the additional heat, which has so far been absorbed by the atmosphere instead of radiating out into, the, into space, has gone back into the ocean because the ocean covers 70% of the Earth. So I would say that the bigger deal for Hawaii is the amount of heat that's been absorbed in the ocean and the direct effect that has on weather systems uh, which are affecting you. Yes, there are influences as well on the development of ridges and troughs. Uh, I would be interested to know if uh, uh, that I haven't studied it myself. My focus has been on, on um, mountains and, and northern latitudes, uh, but I would be interested to know if there's been an increase, for example, in uh, the frequency and strength of storms which have been impacting the islands. Uh, but uh, it's a really key issue, again, which people are exploring, is just how much of this additional heat are the oceans able to absorb before it starts messing them up in a really serious manner in all sorts of different ways. Now, as far as what we can do is concerned, oh my goodness, it's a really tricky thing to say because each one of our actions has a part. There's a, a saying I like, which is no single raindrop likes to believe that it is responsible for the flood, which means that the actions of all of us put together add up to a much greater whole. So our choices in how much we consume and how much we emit in the way of uh, greenhouse gases. If you think that each time we buy something, there's an awful lot of energy that's been expended in uh, gathering together the raw materials, in sending them off to the place where whatever it is you're buying is, is put together and then shipping it to you. Every step in that chain is contributing something in terms of emissions into the atmosphere. We've become very used, I think, to saying, I want that and I'm going to get it. But we should perhaps be thinking, hmm, I think I've got enough. We need to go from thinking uh, about how much more can I get to whether or not I have enough to be getting on with for my needs. Instead of having too much, we need just enough. That would be my, my fundamental advice to people. And I think it's the, you know, it's the most central advice that we can give to all our students today. It's something that we touch upon in a lot of our, our climate conversations, our biodiversity conversations, this essence of don't waste, whether that's food, whether that's emissions, whether that's anything. If you live within your means, if you cut down even just a little bit, and it's not about, you know, uh, changing your lifestyle entirely. People do do that. And that is something that you can certainly aspire to. But small little actions that we can do as a classroom, as an individual, every single day make a big difference. Um, and so I, I'm really glad we got a chance to answer that question. I know it's the big question, but it's, it's one that I, I appreciate you taking a stab at, Michael. Um, let's take two more questions, guys. I'm going to go to Miss Peck's class. And then we've got another one from YouTube. And we'll wrap up from there. So Miss Peck, if you guys want to unmute your mic, come on in and go for it. Hi, guys. Do you ever think that warmer places, I mean, warmer places will get more cold, colder than cold places already? Uh, that's a good question. So you're thinking, well, are we going to get a kind of flip? Are we going to get cold equators and warm poles? That's pretty unlikely. I would say, mm, yeah, I would say pretty much impossible because there's still a 
big influence uh, in those, those first few slides I was showing, which relate uh, the Earth's axis of rotation, the fact that it's tilted so that the North Pole uh, gets pretty much 24-7 sunlight during the summer and 24-7 nighttime during much of the winter. That is always going to be the biggest single influence. And no, there isn't a mechanism, there isn't a way in which the lower latitudes near the equator, which we associate with being much warmer, are going to get colder. The overall idea, the, 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 the way in which things look as if they are unfolding based on all sorts of different types of observation, of measuring, over a long period of time, is that warm places are going to get a bit warmer and cold places are going to get a lot warmer. There are very, very few places on the planet which are getting cooler at all. There are a few and they are linked to places like the Arctic. And there are complicated reasons which help to explain this. But generally speaking, if we look at maps of how temperatures are changing when they're averaged over long periods of time, there's not much getting cooler. And those are in very, very particular cases where, where certain influence are, are, are causing that. Overall, the colors that we use to draw out temperature change are yellows to reds, showing relatively small to quite substantial temperature increases. And how much that is depends on how much more uh, greenhouse gas goes into the atmosphere. Yeah, we've got questions like that on YouTube about what the future status is and, you know, if we do uh, business as usual versus a, a more modest approach versus, you know, we, we really all band together and do really serious work. I mean, this is something where, again, when I was a kid, climate change was just something that people, you know, we, we chatted about. It was like a casual hypothetical in the future. And now it's something that all the classes are living with. So uh, to get the chance to talk about this sort of thing and to highlight some of these changes that might be happening uh, and also what we can do to stop it are, are really, really impactful and important, I think. Oh, for it's your... so important. It's oh. so important. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> um, we'll wrap up with one more question. Time flies and you're having fun, people. Uh, so Mr. Tunis's class, they're joining us at the Pineland School in Burlington. They want to know, we, we talked about Hawaii earlier for Canadian kids we've got a lot of Canadian classes today a lot of Ontario groups is there something that we can expect um, how the vortex how climate change will affect us here in Canada you know sort of in the next five ten years or even right now that you can share with us <laughs> yeah again that's that's something that people are really interested in now one of the patterns people have uh, noticed which seems to be developing more of the time now I, I mentioned how the the jet stream, the tropospheric polar vortex, the one closer down to, to, to the, towards the surface of the Earth. I mentioned how that's affected by things like coastlines and mountains. So guess what? Canada has a fairly big coastline, right? It also has some pretty big mountains. Now, the alignment of the coastline and those mountains tends to guide how the jet stream flows. And my personal observations have been uh, that particularly in the summers uh, there's been a more more often we have seen a ridge developing over the west of the country which is kind of guided by the coastline so you see the jet stream heading up north towards the Yukon and then it dives down to the south the other side of the Rocky Mountains so you have a big ridge over BC which tends quite often uh, to establish warm, dry conditions through some of the summer months and relatively cool conditions uh, during the, um, uh, in the eastern part of the country. So that's a summertime example. The wintertime example is more confusing. It is harder to tell and it's influenced by a number of other factors. It's not just this interaction between the wavier jet stream and the stratospheric polar vortex. There's also the influence of things like El Nino, and La Nina, which uh, have uh, an, an established control over uh, weather patterns in Canada. And there are others as well. There are all sorts of different indices, different types of measurements of what happens in 
various parts of the world, so over particular oceans or particular coastlines, particular latitudes, and trying to understand what the implication of each of these is on what happens with weather is really challenging. To understand what combinations of these influences is, is even more challenging. And then to understand how a warming atmosphere is going to influence these indices and the combinations between them gets more confusing again. So it is very, very difficult to build an idea of what's happening. This is the job that climate modelers are doing. They run complicated computer programs which aim to predict this. And they compare them uh, across different uh, types of, of, of model uh, and where they come up with agreements that tends to improve your confidence that they're telling a, a story which is going to unravel. But of course, we still don't know uh, which influences interact with each other. And that's something that scientists are trying to understand uh, all the time. Well, I mean, the, the scientific answer, again, as you mentioned, this is a very complicated thing, and we're going to be collecting more and more data and showcasing this to the public in, in the biggest possible way over the next few years to come, because it really is going to impact us all. One thing I'd encourage our kids in all our classrooms today is ask your teachers how the world has changed wherever you are since they were kids. I mean, I'm going to be younger than quite a few of your teachers probably, and even for me, the way that, you know, the seasons gar here in Toronto has radically changed. It's very different. It's a very different experience living here than it used to be when I was your age. And so you can get that sort of firsthand experience from your parents, your teachers, and more, and see that these changes aren't something that's, you know, a hundred years down the road. It's not a hypothetical. It's something that's happening right now. And I think that that's a, a really important point to this. So uh, for all of you guys today, thank you so much for, for sitting down and, and listening to Michael's presentation. That was really, really fantastic. I want to stress again, that this is part of our series of the Arctic Institute of North America at UCalgary. So you can check out all their information at arctic.ucalgary.ca and all our past programs with their speakers on our YouTube channel. Um, Michael, this was great, man. I, I want to say thank you personally. And I'm, what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our classes and teachers to say a, a big thank you and farewell as well. Thank um, you. I, I would encourage, if I may, I would yeah. really encourage people uh, uh, within classes and schools to look at that, that website, that earth.nellschool.net. Have a look at different layers of the atmosphere. See what the jet stream is doing and see if you can relate that to what is happening in terms of weather outside your window. That would be a nice thing to be able to do. And if, right. if I can help at all in guiding that, please connect me with people. Yeah, fantastic. So if anyone is keen on that, let me know. And what you can do, Michael, is send me the links to all those, and I'll make sure all the classes get them after the fact today, which would be great. Um, all right, well, let's bring in Miss Russell, Miss Lemire, Miss Peck, and Miss Matsuda's class to say a big farewell. Thank you guys so, so much.